Hi, my name is Julien Emilje, and in this demo, I would like to illustrate how you can use PaleoClim to do some pretty magical things with PaleoClimate time series data. So let me share my screen, and I'm going to show you a number of things. Uh, first, I'm going to show you how you can launch this demo at home. So if you go to the PaleoBooks repository, of which there will be a link uh, available to you, either uh, below or uh, you can just uh, go to github slash linked earth slash paleo books and you see this little icon here says launch binder so we're going to do this and what it's going to do is basically uh, launch a cloud-based uh, worker uh, that's going to uh, progressively load all the requisite software to be able to launch this and while this is doing uh, its job uh, I'm going to present to you um, the activity that we're going to do. So there is no more iconic record, I think, in paleoclimatology than the Epica Dome C record uh, by Jouzel et al. 2007, um, particularly the deuterium data that was published in there, um, which is plotted here below, which you probably have seen many times, and you can see it right above my head here on this corner of the screen. So what I'm going to show in this demo is how to analyze this data set in a number of ways and also how to compare it to CO2 measurements that were taken from the same core and uh, later uh, through a composite of CO2 measurements from Antarctica that was published by Bereiter et al. So first, uh, in Python, you have to load the necessary packages, um, which we do here. Particularly, we import PaleoClim. Uh, and we set a graphical style to make the plots uh, pretty uh, in this notebook context. There's a number of those, by the way, that you can play with, uh, but that's the one I used in this notebook. Then we have to load the data. Uh, so you can do so directly from the uh, NCI slash NOAA website. Uh, however, I found that in this particular data set, there were some missing data that were complicating this feature. So instead, what I did is I put the data into an actual CSV file, a local one, uh, which you can load very simply this way. And you, we load it into an object called a pandas data frame, uh, which is presented here. Now, this is where things start for many people, uh, and you could certainly play a lot and do a lot of things with that data frame. But more importantly, uh, in PaleoClim uh, and with linked earth generally, we really believe in complete metadata. Uh, not actually that complete, but I'll show you how having a modicum of metadata can make a big difference. So we're going to create an object called a PaleoClim series object. That's basically a glorified time series. So it has a time axis, uh, which in this case is the age column from uh, this spreadsheet. Uh, it has a value, basically the Y axis for this series, which is the deuterium data in this case. And then we give it some metadata. Uh, which are, uh, for example, the name of the various uh, things in there and their units. And once you do this, um, all you have to do is invoke one command, in this case plot, and you have a completely annotated plot of your data set uh, with the right the units in the right place. Um, so that's a nice place to begin. Uh, the second thing uh, is upon a closer examination, you may notice that the variability, the high frequency variability is much more pronounced uh, in the latter portion of the data set, the recent portion. And that's because it's the most recent one. Uh, and as you go further down the core, the ice is more and more compacted uh, and there has been more time for diffusion to take place. And some of these high frequency features uh, have died away. And so uh, it's not that difficult to actually extract the time axis, plot the differences, and you can see here the distribution of age increments. And so the practical consequence of this is that you see uh, that um, basically the age increments are uh, non-uniform, and that poses a number of challenges to all kinds of time series analysis techniques, which usually assume that there's uniform spacing. So what do you do? Well, uh, with most packages, uh, that would be a huge issue. But of course, PaleoClim was designed to deal with this sort of difficulty. So in particular, 
For spectral analysis, uh, we have two methods that can be used out of the box, the Lomsk-Cargill periodogram and the weighted wavelet Z-transform uh, that can uh, work on those signs of data sets. So let's start with the Lomsk-Cargill periodogram. Um, and so what we do here is something called method cascading. So what we do is we take our time series object, um, we first standardize it, and then we apply a spectral method. Uh, I use the Lomsk-Cargill method, and uh, you can pass it additional parameters to customize it. And then once you have this object, you can do various things to it, including plotting it, which we do here. Now, what's actually plotted here is the log of the power versus the log of the frequency. But since none of us uh, really can innately relate to uh, the log axis of frequency, I prefer to label it in terms of periods, which are, again, uh, have the proper units here. So 1,000 years, 10,000 years, 100,000 years, and so on. And so it becomes very easy now to identify these peaks. You see that this first peak here is the one corresponding to roughly 23,000 years. That's, of course, precession. This one close to 41,000 years. That's the one corresponding to obliquity forcing. And this one close to 100,000 years uh, it corresponds to the eccentricity forcing. Of course, you know, the major... Uh, forcings of Earth climate on these timescales. Now you notice too that there's a lot of high frequency variability here. Uh, this may or may not actually be an artifact of the analysis, uh, a bit more on that later. But the first question, or the, perhaps the second question once you've obtained such a spectrum is which of these peaks, if any, are statistically significant? And what do we mean by that? Well, do we mean that they stand out with respect to a meaningful kind of null hypothesis? And one such null hypothesis, although by no means the only choice available, is that of an autoregressive process of order one, uh, which many different climate time series tend to exhibit uh, what we call a warm color. You know, they have more uh, low frequency variability than high frequency variability and therefore if you want to gauge the significance of peaks it's not enough to compare it to white noise which would be a flat line you really want to compare it to red noise which is what an autoregressive process of order one or AR1 for short means and so you can do this again very easily. You can apply a significance test in PyloClaim again in one line of code. In this case, we uh, run, we basically generate 200 AR1 surrogates of our time series. So we fit an AR1 model to the time series. Uh, we compute the spectra 200 times, and then we plot this limit. And that's the red curve that you see here uh, on this screen. Uh, and you can see here that basically all of this high frequency stuff is below that 95% threshold, but that the orbital peaks, uh, but notably not the 100,000 year one, poke above that background. So perhaps we're asking a lot of our method here. Perhaps the time axis is a little bit too uh, uneven, uh, even for this method. And so one thing we can do is interpolate. And so again, uh, to illustrate method cascading, what we're doing in this particular cell is we first interpolate with a step of 500 years, then we standardize, then we apply the spectral method, and then we apply a significant test to that, and finally we plot. So this is one very complex workflow that, you know, if you had to write it from scratch, uh, would take many, many lines of code. But in this case, it's all packed very neatly into a single line of code. And once you do this, you see that the method now doesn't spend a bunch of its time looking for variability at more than a thousand years. So uh, the Nyquist frequency, the highest uh, uh, periodicity that can be resolved by the data set is now a thousand years. So that's where it starts. And you can see now that these three orbital peaks poke nicely above uh, the 95% AR1 threshold. Great. Again, no major surprise here. Uh, I mean, you could see it. Uh, over here that, of course, you have ice ages in there, but it's nice to see that these three Milankovitch periodicities really pop out in a spectrum. So that was it for Lomskargol. Uh, we can apply also the weighted wavelet Z transform. Um, I'm going to save this interpolated version of the, the original series for future use because I'm going to be working solely with this uh, from from now on for easier comparisons. 
And so when you apply this, you get this answer. And you can see here a number of differences. Uh, you, can, you still see those uh, pronounced peaks at oblical, sorry, orbital periods. Um, but now the high frequency variability is much more muted in this one. And you also see a very strong uh, linear slope happening here. Remember, these are log-log units. So this is indicative of a power law in this spectrum, which again uh, is known uh, to many people, has been pointed out for a long time. So one cool thing we can do here again is apply a significance test. Now I'm only using 50 surrogates in this case because this method is quite a bit more time consuming than uh, Lom's cargo. Uh, so it takes about four and a half minutes to get just these 50 one. If, if you're more patient than me, you can certainly run more than that. But for uh, a demo, I think this is enough. Uh, you can afford, of course customize uh, that number uh, when you run it yourself. And then we can also, since we are in fact dealing with uh, interpolated data now with a uniform spacing of 500 years, you can apply more uh, standard methods, like for example, the multi-taper method, uh, which is uh, presented in blue on this plot. And um, again, with very few lines of code, you can plot everything on the same graph. And that gives you an indication of which of these spectral features is likely to be robust to the method used uh, and, which we're not doing here, uh, within every single method, you can also tweak the various adjustable parameters. Um, so PaleoClim enables those kinds of explorations uh, very easily, uh, basically these kinds of sensitivity analysis to make sure that the conclusions you make about your analysis are really robust to a number of methodological choices. Okay. A couple more features, uh, not definitely not exhaustive, but um, one thing that uh, PaleoClaim also enables is so-called singular spectrum analysis, which is basically a time-based method of empirical decompositions. It's basically decomposing your time series in a number of um, oscillations, uh, and these oscillations are uh, ranked in decreasing order of importance. So the more important oscillations, uh, the most important one would be the one corresponding to this first eigenvalue. Uh, this is called a scree plot. Basically, the eigenvalues is a function of rank. And um, the first eight eigenvalues in this particular case uh, correspond to something like 99% of the variance. And so you can basically select these first eight modes, or the first uh, eight modes corresponding to those eigenvalues, and um, do a so-called reconstruction of your time series. Um, and that's the orange curve on this particular plot. And you can see that it does a really good job at capturing uh, those uh, ice ages, but it skips a lot of the more high frequency oscillations, which in this case it would kind of view as, as noise, so to speak. Uh, so this is you know, a very um, uh, subjective way of truncating. There's some more objective truncation options uh, that are implemented in the package, but um, you know I, I use this one for simplicity. And the thing you can do now is basically use this orange curve to boost the signal to noise ratio to say, hey, if I'm after orbital scale variability, uh, instead of working with the blue curve, I'm going to work with the orange one. And so we do this here where we plot the, the previously obtained uh, WWZ spectrum in blue, and then we superimpose on top of that the one from this SSA reconstruction. And you can see here that it basically leaves the orbital scales untouched, uh, but it cuts a lot of the high frequencies, uh, which is you know what you see here as the difference between the blue and the orange one. Now you might say, well, that's basically a low pass filter you just did, um, and you would not be wrong. Um, so in fact, um, Filtering is also something that PaleoClaim enables very easily. Um, so with, again, one line of code, you can apply a filter to your data set. By default, it's a low pass filter, although it's very easy to make it into a band pass filter, for instance. Uh, there are four different methods of filtering that are implemented. I used only one here, which, which is a Langshaw's filter. And you can either specify the cutoff frequency, if you like to think in terms of frequency. Personally, I'm more fond of scales. So here I'm gonna cut all the variability at scales shorter than 10 years. Uh, and that's what you do here. And then again, by method cascading, you can directly plot this uh, in one fell swoop. And uh, that 
is you know a very short uh, lightning fast illustration of filtering capabilities in PaleoClip which again so you can do with frequency domain filtering like this one uh, actually Langshaus is a time domain technique uh, or you can do SSA or you can do any number of things I want also to showcase wavelet analysis so one of the great things with the weighted wavelet Z transform is that uh, in um, in addition to giving you a global power spectrum, uh, you can use it to compute wavelet spectra on an unevenly spaced uh, data series, which is what we do here. Um, um, well, in this case, we use the, the evenly spaced one for, uh, for ease of use uh, because I didn't want to have to wait too long. It already took something like 10 minutes to generate this one. Uh, and that's because I, again, uh, requested something like 100 different surrogates. So I had to compute effectively 101 different spectra. Uh, and so that takes a little bit of time. Um, but definitely, if, if you are planning to use this for a publication, I recommend using a fairly high number. Uh, in other words, you'll have to be a little more patient. But if you just want to play with this, you can reduce the number uh, just to see what it does. Um, another cool thing you can do is, uh, I mentioned before, uh, not only are the peaks uh, of interest in a spectrum, but also the continuum. And so one thing that uh, might be of interest is to estimate the scaling exponent associated with uh, this power law, uh, which we do here. So again, this is one function called the beta underscore EST. Uh, it has several parameters, including uh, what, what is the maximum frequency, what is the lowest frequency you want to look at. Um, and basically it fits a straight line through your data set uh, and it gives you an estimate of the scaling exponent with some uncertainties. So all of this in one line of code, uh, extremely handy. Finally, um, I want to finish by showcasing how you can compare uh, two different series in a number of ways. And so in this case, naturally, we want to compare temperature and CO2 uh, from the same core or actually a composite of nearby cores from Antarctica. And that's the Bereiter et al. 2015 data set. So this one uh, didn't have a, a missing data. So I was able to directly import it from the NOAA FTP site. Uh, you see here, very handy function call. And it loads uh, the uh, the spreadsheet basically directly as, again, a pandas data frame. And again, I'm going to convert this to a PaleoClim series object, uh, basically incorporating some metadata along with these data. And again, you can plot it very handily. And so you get, again, these very well-known ice ages, as well as, of course, uh, this incredibly precipitous rise over the instrumental or, sorry, uh, industrial era. So we can now do a, a number of things. Um, I'm going to create what's called a multiple series object, uh, where I basically put both uh, the deuterium and the CO2 record into one single object. And then the default plot method gives me something like that. So by default, uh, it, it plots both of these on the same axis, which of course is not ideal here because the CO2 is in units of parts per million, the deuterium is in units of per mil. Uh, and so one thing you may want to do is first standardize the data so they are on a comparable scale, uh, which again, you can do uh, by method cascading here in just one line. And so now you can start seeing that, yes, these ice ages express themselves very strongly in temperature and um, in CO2. And in fact, in most cases, they are nearly synchronous. Now, you may know that for a long time, there was uh, a certain timeline in between those two variables, uh, which uh, you may be curious about. And so one of the things you could do is um, look at this in a number of ways. Uh, so a second type of plot that we have is called a stack plot. Um, so it's of limited interest here where you have only two time series, but it's a really handy way to visualize many time series at once by, you know, as the name implies, stacking them uh, one under the other. And uh, even though I'm only using the default options here, uh, these plots are very customizable. You can change the labels, you can change the colors uh, and the, you know, the type of lines and all kinds of things. Again, everything is uh, documented uh, in a number of notebooks and in our documentation, which is listed at the end. All right, so the real uh, tool that I'm going to use here, the quantitative tool that I'm going to use to compare these two time series, this so-called wavelet transform coherency. 
Uh, basically what it is, is a correlation coefficient in time and frequency space. And so if two series co-vary very strongly at a particular scale and for a particular interval of time, uh, their coherency will be close to one. And if they don't, the coherency will be close to zero. And so this is what this plot shows. Uh, it's the value of that coefficient as a function of age here on the x-axis and the period, or if you prefer scale, uh, on the y-axis. And so we can see that for actually most of these scales, particularly at the orbital periods, uh, the two uh, series resemble each other a lot, which again is no major surprise given how visually similar they are. Um, you can also measure the phase angle, and that's what these little arrows are showing. Uh, when the arrows are pointing to the right, it means that there's zero phase angle between the two series. When the arrows are pointing to the left, it means that there's 180 degrees uh, phase difference between them. So they're basically out of phase. And then uh, they could be in phase quadrature if the arrows are pointing up or down. So we see that for the majority of this record, uh, the arrows are actually almost exactly in phase. Uh, again, not surprising given um, you know, what we observed earlier, but you may be, for example, wondering about the more small scale variability here. And you know, is there a consistent phase relationship between rapid oscillations in, let's say, temperature and CO2? Um, and so you can look at that and you see that, yes, there are actually some out of phase differences, but if you look at any of those scales, Sometimes you see the, the temperature leading, sometimes you see the temperature lagging. So uh, at least from this analysis, it does, it does not appear that there is a consistent phase relationship between those two. And so I would refrain from making a lot of conclusions about that because it's not a, a consistent one. Uh, and there are you know, quantitative metrics that make that more rigorous, but that's basically all I wanted to do here. Again, you can... Um, uh, establish how significant these various islands of coherency are uh, and we do this again uh, using um, a uh, AR1 benchmark uh, again with uh, 100 benchmarks uh, and in this case it takes something like 20 minutes in our binder environment uh, and you get the answer. And that concludes our tutorial. Um, there's a lot more in our documentation of which we're very proud. So this is it right here. Uh, and there's a number of things you can search and navigate. So I will let you do that. Uh, and if uh, you want to see more about this notebook, uh, you can go back to the, uh, the Paleo Books repository uh, and look for uh, the various notebooks. Right now, uh, this is the only demo that's available at the moment because we just uh, went through a major revamp, uh, but there will be many more demos available in the future.